At the start of the First World War, it was very clear to many military officials, including Lord Kitchener, that Britain needed to bolster its army very quickly. So within a few days of war breaking out in August 1914, instruction was given out for Indian troops to be mobilised and transferred over to Europe. The British authorities didn't want um, the fresh soldiers leaving England and going to France and seeing the wounded soldiers limbless and in bandage. It wouldn't be good for morale. So they send a shout out to the southeast of England for accommodation for hospitals. And um, Brighton immediately responded. It was ideal because Brighton is a holiday resort, is considered as a healthy place to be, the seer. And historically, people come to Brighton for the health. The Royal Pavilion was the first building in Brighton to be converted into a hospital for Indian troops. And it was the building that was used for that purpose for the longest. But it was not the only building in Brighton that was used for that purpose. The biggest hospital, which opened in February 1915, was known as the Kitchener Hospital. And this used the buildings that at the time formed the largest workhouse in Brighton, which is a very large, imposing, quite austere building on the top of the race hill, which is now used as Brighton General Hospital. Now that was a more difficult building to use because the inmates, as they were known at the time, had to be rehoused and there were certainly newspaper reports at the time which indicate that some of those uh, poor people in the workhouse found themselves living in Sussex Square, which is quite a transition in Brighton across the social classes, but as patriotic as the people of Sussex Square were, I think their patriotism was perhaps a little stretched by having paupers in, in their vicinity. A big part of the pavilion's role was to actually present a very positive view of the British Empire back to India. It was really there to validate the British Empire, to actually send the message back to India to say, you know, these are, your men are being very well treated. They're treated in a former royal palace, um, they're being treated with great respect to their, their religious and cultural needs, which is why you have the rigorous arrangements made in terms of dietary requirements even stretching through to, most poignantly, the um, arrangements made for those, those men who died here. There were separate, separate arrangements for the dead, for instance. There were um, the Chatri for the Hindu Sikhs and the Gurkhas who were, who were Hindus. And the Muslims were taken to Woken, to the Jah Shahan Mosque in Woken, to be buried. The Chatri was originally thought of in 1915. Um, by uh, Lieutenant Gupta from the Indian Medical Corps, who actually put the suggestion to the Mayor Brighton, Sir John Otter, who immediately take it on. And Sir, o Sir John Otter was instrumental in doing the Chatri and the India Gate itself. There are newspaper reports which indicate that local people were intensely proud and also curious of, of what was happening in the hospitals here. Uh, local newspapers reported that when the men first arrived in Brighton, that people were lining the route from uh, the station down to the Royal Pavilion to actually cheer the men on as they arrived. I mean, this was really seen as something to be very, very proud about and the role that Brighton was playing in terms of supporting the empire coming together. Brighton Museum is uh, planning on commemorating the city's involvement in the First World War by holding an exhibition called War Stories, Voices from the First World War. And we're looking at a range of individuals' wartime experiences and the impact it had on their lives, their families' lives and the communities they lived in. The Indian Army would travel with their scribes and they were the ones that would write the letters for the Indian soldiers. Um, the census department at that time reckoned that there was 15,000 letters a week that was written by the Indian soldiers, many of them while they were in hospitals in Brighton. And they're very touching indeed, very touching letters. We've been collaborating with an organisation based in Delhi. They've been running a similar project to us. They've been um, collecting stories and memories from descendants of Indian soldiers. So we were very keen to find out if they'd found any descendants from soldiers who may have been hospitalised in Brighton. 
their help has enabled us to find um, a letter which was sent from a hospital in Brighton back to India. They love Brighton, they love the people of Brighton. They just love the place. They, one Indian soldier woke up from the music room in the Royal Pavilion and, and thought he had died and woke up in heaven. A great example of a personal story from the time is Florence Holdgate, who owned the nurse's uniform you see behind me. She wore this uniform um, when she was a nurse in the Kitchener Hospital for Indian soldiers. She was then posted to Egypt where she continued her nursing duties um, before moving to Hove after the war. One of the challenges and most important parts of the exhibition is making it relevant to a modern day audience. And one element of this is surprising people and encouraging people to, to look at things around them in a new way. For example, the Indian Gate um, at the entrance to the Pavilion Gardens, which they may walk through hundreds of times a week, um, and understanding that, that the legacy of that comes from the First World War. Now most people see this gate and just assume it's part of the long-standing architecture of the pavilion because of its broadly, um, obviously, Indian design. What's interesting about that gate is it's not, strictly speaking, a war memorial. It's not there to commemorate the, those who died here, which is the, the purpose of the Chattery on the Downs. The purpose of that gate is very expressly that it's a gift from the people of India to the people of Brighton as thanks for the care given to the Indian patients here. I hope the Indian Hospital will be remembered for long times to come. It, it's a fascinating story, there are multiple tellings of it, and as India emerges as a growing economic power and redefines itself, I hope people find new ways of telling and understanding this story.